You're listening to Rock, Pop, and Roll. Rock, Pop, and Roll. The rock and roll of, of Minneapolis and, and Minnesota. The country rock. The punk rock of Minneapolis. It's part two of rock, pop, and roll as we're looking at the sound of, of, of Minneapolis. A small town can become known for a musical signature sound, right? It's called the Bakersfield sound or the Muscle Shoals sound. Sounds and bands and vibes tied to big cities like Zydeco drums and the street sounds of New Orleans, the funk and the the gloss of Motown sound of Detroit, the mix of garage rock into new wave that was Boston. And like the swampy soul of Memphis, the sound of 90s grunge and alternative rock in Seattle, and the 60s and 70s groove and soul of Philadelphia. Dave Grohl made a documentary travel series. It was called Sonic Highways in 2014. Eight episodes explored the musical history of a different American city each week. The Foo Fighters then wrote and recorded a new song in that city, wherever they were. And the best of times, best of tunes, they were kind of taking the, the roots of the music of that city and infusing it into their own sounds. So, why Minneapolis? What is it? That's what I want to understand. It's it's a couple of things. In episode one, we looked at Prince, and now it's rock and roll, and how did those two mix? This is rock, pop, and roll. There is the uh, significant yet subtle Minneapolis influence of the Americana roots rock sound of the 80s and 90s, and the, the, then, there's, then there's Prince. Part one... We dove into how Prince, why Prince might have sounded like he sounded. But the sound of Minneapolis, it wasn't, it wasn't just Prince. What he became was the product of a city and the multicultural melting pot of music, Midwest or not. By some confluence of events and karma, there was a, a gang of bands that rocked and called Mini, Minneapolis home. This rock and roll podcast, Rock, Pop, and Roll, Part two of the Minneapolis connection. It's a primer put together. My thought was, well, let's put together um, some of the bands, best, most influential, because of commercial success or integrity or both. Every city has musical stories. This is one city, and it's a few of those stories, a few of those musical stories of Minneapolis. And I wanna change it. As a band called the Gear Daddies, one of my faves. So we're going to dig deeper. Be on the surface, but then we're going to go go a little bit deeper. Here's some stuff that that I hadn't heard in a long time. But we do have to talk, before before we move further, we do have to talk about Prince as we move to the guitar, rock, and drums of what we are calling the root sound of Minnesota. Because if you really look at it, Prince was a, a product, a byproduct of listening to rock music and funk and disco and R&B and all of it. He stirred it all up inside his music. For the first part of his career, Prince depended mostly on R&B radio for airplay. I Wanna Be Your Lover was a, a moderate pop hit, a hit outside of the Twin Cities before it was a hit at home. The Dirty Mind and Controversy albums made him a critical favorite, but it was still R&B radio. Then Controversy, the song off the album, broke big in Detroit. Detroit would be Prince's hideout, his radio hideout, breaking him citywide before any place else. Then he, then he was a hit at home. San Francisco was another early market for Prince. And then in 1983, 
Little Red Corvette was an important part in making Top 40 and Rock Radio at least consider, if not play, black artists and their music. Michael Jackson, he gets a lot of credit, especially with the, the Billie Jean and the Beat It video in MTV. But I say Prince, with his deeper funk, groove, and sex, was the true tipping point for a lot of radio stations. He was, I think, the one who opened the door for more artists of color in the early to mid-1980s. A pop genius, an experimenter, a virtuoso, and smart. The melding of rock and funk that made him create, helped him create the Minneapolis sound, Morris Day in the Time, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, Vanity, Dylan, Bob Dylan was from Minnesota too. Hibbing is not the Twin Cities. Still, his music was the most important music in America in the mid-1960s, and that was also a part of the piece of Prince, those political, social lyrics in common with Dylan. Rock and Minnesota and First Avenue and the 7th Street entry and Dylan's positively 4th Street, all a part of the style and the sound of great American and Americana rock and roll that rolled out of the upper Midwest. Rock, pop, and roll, how these bands find find their sounds. How did it mix with Prince? There's a record store owner by the name of Peter Jesperson, a recording engineer by the name of Paul Stark, and a writer for the St. Paul Pioneer Press, Charlie Hallman. They started a, a record label in 1977 called Twin Tone Records. The idea was to release local punk and new wave singles. Jesperson discovered the replacements in 1980. The replacements, they ran concurrently with Prince because Prince was late with late 70s and, you know, he didn't hit big until 83 was the 1999 album, Purple Rain. After that, it was a different road for sure for the replacements and for Prince, but both heard the same radio stations growing up and the replacements and Prince mattered to rock and roll in the 80s in different ways. Now, Westerberg told Rolling Stone that right as we were getting together, I remember reading there was a guy from Minneapolis who had a huge hit. It was his first hit, I Want to Be Your Lover, Westerberg said. But it wasn't played here. Westerberg said he must have been about 19 at the time. He said, I bought the record and I loved it. It was like everything that we were not doing. You know, melodies slick and simple and perfect. We were full of the punk stuff at the time. It sort of put us in perspective, like, okay, we'll go as far as we can with our limited talent, but this is the real deal. This guy, this guy is the real shit. Prince was Lynn drums, keyboards, funk, and dance, and rock and roll all stirred together. The replacements, what they do, well, they faked indifference. Probably cared way more than only they would admit to. And they did it through a haze of average, sometimes horrible shows, with bursts of occasional shining diamonds in there of, of a live performance, appearing to remind everyone why they did matter. Lyrics and attitude and a skittering, punkish, throwback rock and roll sound, usually loud and usually drunk. So here's where we start. The bus boards in Minneapolis and takes the ride through the bands that evoked Springsteen, nodded to Uncle Tupelo, played with pop and roots rock abandon. Bands that sounded like they really wanted to matter. Sounded like they'd been listening to Minneapolis music. So the replacement's doing a, a, a Prince cover. I could never take the place of your man. The nod to Prince. Well, the replacement started in 1979. Guitarist, vocalist Paul Westerberg, Bob Stinson on guitar, bass player, little brother Tommy Stinson, and drummer Chris Mars. The band's first album, Sorry Ma, Forgot to Take Out the Trash, was released in 1981. Let It Be was released in October of 1984. Critics liked it. Let It Be. They named an album Let It Be. Did all right for them. Ranked number 12 on Spin Magazine's list of the 25 greatest albums of all time. The replacements, though, they were a mess on stage, usually. And they alienated label reps by intentionally performing poorly. 
They had a 1985 uh, live cassette album called The Shit Hits the Fans, and it's one concert performance from that time. Unfinished songs starting and stopping abruptly. It's it's cute for 15 minutes. I remember being excited that I found this thing, and I got it and listened to it, and it's annoying when you really want to think about how great they could be if they let themselves be. Their first major label album was called Tim, produced by... The guy, Tommy Ramone, Tommy Erderly, on Sire Records in 85. There's the infamous uh, Saturday Night Live story. Have you you heard that one? January 1986, the replacements got a last-minute request to appear as musical guests on SNL. Scheduled act Pointer Sisters. Couldn't make it. The musical director of the time, the great G.E. Smith, was a replacements fan. So he got the replacements. And they came out. And they, well, think about this. Saturday Night Live. For show day, you have to show up early. As a band, you run through your performance at least two times so the cameras can block so they know where you're going, who's going to be singing, who's going to be playing the solos, what cameras is going to shoot what musician. So in the afternoon, the story goes, G.E. Smith was, I saw this video on YouTube talking about this night. Band was fine in the afternoon. But by the time they got to dress rehearsal and then the showtime, you know, it's a, it's 11.30. They're playing at 12, 12, 10, whenever, Eastern time. The, the bands played their first song. So they performed Kiss Me on the Bus, Drunk. They had a off-balance, off-kilter Bastards of the Young that they played. According to Smith, Bob Stinson, the guitar player, tripped in the hallway, fell over his guitar, and broke it as he was headed to the stage. So Smith had to scramble to find a guitar to loan him. Found one, one of the house band's instruments. It was a disaster, but it was also the replacements that their fans would probably cheer for and expect. It's from that SNL performance of that night. And probably unexpected to a lot of people tuning in. The replacements. Were they famous enough to be known by enough people to think, I I get it. There you go. Bob Stinson was kicked out of the band in 1986. A new guitarist by the name of Slim Dunlap joined his lead guitarist. Pleased to Meet Me was the 1987 album that was recorded in Memphis. Big star producer Jim Dickinson was behind the board. He used to work at the legendary Ardent Studios in Memphis in the late 60s and early 70s. Produced some great, but not necessarily big hit music in the 90s and early 2000s. He did some work for North Mississippi All-Stars, John Hyatt, The Radiators, Rye Cooter, G-Love, and Special Sauce. And then it was the Don't Tell a Soul album, and I'll Be You, the latter of which topped the modern rock chart in Billboard magazine. That was the album and the tour and the push where the replacements, this was their, seemingly, this was the thought, this is what I thought as a, a guy in radio back at the time. Replacements had always been a little sloppy for me. This was seemingly the record that was going to make them a little more mainstream, or at least be able to have a job and a life where they're not traveling in vans. So they had a tour opening slot for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and disastrous. So there was a box set. Don't Tell a Soul was the album in 89. I'll Be You was the single. There's a box set that came out in 2019, and it's that album, Don't Tell a Soul, reimagined. What if, instead of making a grab at being radio-friendly with their kind of rock, what if it would have been mixed or recorded differently? Is that really their best material and performance for that record, but it was just hidden by Shine? That was kind of the question. There were essentially two recording sessions, each with a different producer. Tony Berg was at the board for the first session that they shelved until this box set where it's heard. And then Matt Wallace produced the sessions for the album as it would be heard. Now, he he didn't mix it. He produced it. 
Now, Wallace, that's key to know. Wallace produced bands like OAR. He produced Faith No More, Maroon 5, School of Fish. He would go on to produce some American rock and roll from Blackberry Smoke and their Whippoorwill album in 2012. He was the guy who produced one of my favorite albums, John Hyatt, and his perfectly good guitar album. Wallace was always, for my money, good at getting like a separate and uh, distinct and a clean guitar sound. It was radio pop rock really, that he made with enough of a jagged and loud edge to sound rough and tumble for something that clean. So that was a skill he had. His work with the replacements on that album is really good. It's It was the final card, though, that tumbled the house for the replacement fans who'd loved and allowed the punk kids to become alternative darlings. It led to this, straight up as replacement fans saw it, a grab at stardom. Is that true or right or what? I don't know. I'll Be You went to number 51, the only Hot 100 appearance for the replacements. It was number one on Modern Rock Radio, number one on the rock charts. This Dead Man's Pop is intriguing because it includes a new mix and sequence of that Don't Tell a Soul album inspired by the one who produced it, Matt Wallace. The mix he made just before the record was turned over to to another mixer, Uh, Westerberg said, It sounded good until the label brought in people to mix it and make it sound like everything else on the radio. So I didn't hate it at the time. I thought I'll Be You was a great piece of radio rock and roll candy, slagged by bands and critics who screamed sellout into the night. But the mix used in this Dead Man's Pop, Wallace had thrown down years before it was discovered in ex-guitarist Slim Dunlap's house. The same performance as the original album, different mix. On Spotify... The Berg Sessions, recorded in Bearsville, New York, can be heard. Though they're bashed online in reviews, they sound, to me, a whole lot like a vibe that would be thrown at you by somebody like Wilco. So there's three versions of of that album. The Bearsville version. I'm waiting for the day to kill. Just a game Then I'll break down Just in case Oh yeah Just a uh, slower Lazier But by uncovering and presenting all the material from those sessions in remixed, original, and reimagined forms, it, it goes a long way for me to help rehabilitate that image that the replacements were bad and sloppy and drunk and too ripped to record and really care. The box set shows a band that probably threw away their chances at big rock and roll success in the big tent through years of crass actions and don't give a shit efforts that disguised a band that really did care. I wanted to go back and play for you the two versions, the released version of I'll Be You and then the similar piece of music in the Matt Wallace mix to let you see see if you can hear the difference. So this was the original release, the I'll Be You single. And if it's just a game, then I'll break down just in case. Hurry up, hurry up, we're running in our last race. So that's... That's what was released as a single, and here is the Matt Wallace mix. And if it's just a game, then I'll break down just in case. Hurry up, hurry up. we're running in our last race. Well, I laugh. For me, the guitars are more distinct. Cleaner, couldn't it not cleaner, clearer, and, and not as much of the reverb or the echo uh, on the original Matt Wallace mix. I like it. it I, it's a little dirtier, but still sounds good. The final album that Westerberg and the band recorded was mostly with session musicians. He was persuaded to release it as a replacements album. All shook down. The debut single went to number one on the modern rock radio chart. <laughs> A footnote, but a, a direct link to, to what Paul Westerberg was going to sound like solo. 
over the next decade or so. It brought you down to watch America go Replacements played their first show in 22 years at Riot Fest in Toronto back in 2013. Tommy Stinson and Paul Westerberg together. Dunlap has passed away. Bob Stinson has passed away. Chris Mars was replaced as the drummer in 1990. Westerberg said his first recollection of seeing Prince, he saw Prince, a dress rehearsal for one of his early tours. Paul said he was standing next to other musicians. He said a couple of other guys that were up and comers and thought they were hot shit, he said. They were watching Prince. Westerberg said one guy turned to him and said, I'm embarrassed to be alive. Prince was so good. It was like uh, Westerberg remembers saying, what are we doing? This guy's like on a different planet than we are. Showmanship, one of the guys said. It was rock and roll. It was fun. It was great. They knew. Paul Westerberg knew. Look at the replacement's late career work. It's not sloppy. It's raw. It's a bit off balance. Not straight, slick, and poppy, but what the back half of the 1980s worked for the replacements, and especially around Don't Tell a Soul and the great re-release of all that music on that box set, shows that they turned into a band of musicians who got it. This is rock, pop, and roll. The sound of guitar, rock, and roll, and pop, too, in Minneapolis in the 1980s. There are Minneapolis bands that we dive into a few that you know, some you might be acquainted with, and if you're a fan of Americana, you've heard them and maybe know more than I do. That's cool. There's a band that's out of Minneapolis, St. Paul, the Jayhawks, an American alternative rock and country rock band led by Gary Loris and Mark Olson. Their country rock influence seeped into this band. Mark Perlman's played bass with them since 1984. I get a kinship with Midwest bands like Uncle Tupelo, Gear Daddies, and Honey Dogs. How does a band like The Replacements? And then the Jayhawks, the more country-ish version, and it, it all comes out of the same place that, that Prince came out of. That's beautiful. Their first album, The Jayhawks, was released on a small independent label back in 86. Twin Tone Records decided to issue the demos of the group in 89. In 92, the Jayhawks had their first major label release. It was called Hollywood Town Hall. It only got up to 192 on the charts. I would have thought higher. I would have. More influential than that. It was a, uh, uh, on the modern rock charts. It crawled up to number 20. I heard it a lot. I think I want to say I heard it on WTTS a lot, the radio station out of Bloomington, Indianapolis, in our area. That song that was more of a hit, I thought, than it really was. It seems ubiquitous. It seems like I heard this a lot. Jayhawks released an album in 95 called Tomorrow the Green Grass. It had a, a non-hit, went to number 92, called Blue, and then they did a, a re-recording, a revision that sounded a lot like the original of, of this one. I'm in love, but I must have picked a bear trying to be in love. A bear trying to be in love. So they got some alternative radio airplay. Not, not big, not top 40 hits, but consistent. Olsen quit the Jayhawks to care for his wife, Victoria Williams. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. The albums that came out after he left, 2003, an album called uh, Rainy Day Music, 2011, Mockingbird Time, which went to number 38 on the album charts and was a number two folk album. And then the summer of 2009, the Jayhawks reunited for a couple of festival dates in Spain. There was some success there, and they wanted to bring the reunion back to the U.S., so they wrote some new songs that became that Mockingbird Time album and their first release since uh, that 2003 they toured. Olsen eventually left again. Uh, Loris continues to work without him. They released an album in 2018 called Back Roads and Abandoned Motels, which is very good. And in 2020, the core lineup of Loris Perlman, longtime drummer Tim O'Regan, and longtime keyboardist Karen Grutberg released a new album called XOXO, the Jayhawks album. So they're out on the road. As we record this, they had just played with Emmylou Harris in Toronto at Massey Hall. Good gig. From that XOXO album... They 
can still turn the guitars up just a bit. I like that. And then there was one uh, that they had released on the Back Roads and Abandoned Motels album. A song that I didn't know. This was one something I found out. I said, like, I should have known that because I recognized the song. I said, that sounds so familiar. What is that from? It was a song that was co-written with the Dixie Chicks, or the Chicks, uh, Natalie Maines, Marty McGuire, and Emily Robison. From their great Taking the Long Way album, this is one that was Jayhawks co-written. Open no one else will find the lies Beautiful song. The Jayhawks, beautiful band. Made great music. Still make great music. And we got so much. We're out of time. There's going to be a part three. So this, uh, I got a last, a last fact and a last song for you. So hang on for that. Part three, I'll drop it quickly. So it'll be a week after this part two. Uh, it can be found on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher and Spotify and iHeart and everywhere you find your podcasts. We we won't make you wait a month. We'll drop it part three quickly and look at the back half, including a band that sold more records than any of the, the bands that we're going to talk about that had been banging around since 1981. Hang on for that part three. I'm Rob. This is Rock, Pop, and Roll. One last fact, one last song. Don't forget you can uh, you can find all the uh, episodes rockpopandroll.com. That's the best place to go. Just to, uh, that's that's the clearing house. That's the warehouse of all the information. Last quote. Last quote. It's not a last fact. It's a last quote. We're going to talk about this band in the in that uh, final. I think it's going to be the final episode, part three. I don't think we go part four. <laughs> Bob Mould of the band Husker Du. Big punk, pop punk, mostly punk, loud, noisy band. But uh good band. Twin Cities of the 1980s was a very special time for all of us, Bob Mould said. All of us local musicians. There were the North Minneapolis R&B artists, the South Minneapolis guitar rock bands, and at the center of it all was Prince and First Avenue in the 7th Street entry. Look at how Husker do. More. In episode 3. The Jayhawks recorded with... Who did they... There's your trivia. Who did they record with? They were the backing band for this guy... For two albums, as a matter of fact. The Jayhawks, for our one last fact, were the backing band for Ray Davies of the Kinks on two of his records. On his 2017 record, Americana, which was recorded at the Kinks Cox Studios in uh, London. Jayhawks were the backing band. All 15 tracks were written by Ray Davies. He liked it. Somebody liked it so much that 2018, they did it again. The Jayhawks backed Ray Davies on the album Our Country. Americana Act 2. So to leave you, a little bit of that Ray Davies backed by the Jayhawks sound. A song called Mystery. The Mystery Room. This is Rock, Pop, and Roll. Rock, Pop, and Roll.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Rob. Be good to each other. Yeah.